See, I'm not disappearing. That actually happened once years ago. I'm in my first pulpit, which is a very large pulpit in a small church, and a three-year-old girl is sitting down in front. And of course, she's not paying attention because I'm preaching, and she's three years old. Do the math. So she's playing around and behind the chairs, and she's looking up from time to time. And I sat down, which was at some distance from the pulpit, and she was in a sight line such that she couldn't see me sitting down, and a voice as large as anyone in the room could make stood up, looked around, and said, hey, when did Fred sneak out? (laughs) Many a time I wished I had followed her advice. The Sabbath is the time to notice. Even good old Ralph Waldo Emerson, radical, weirded out, Ralph Waldo Emerson said the Sabbath was the key to spiritual liveness. So should we observe the Sabbath, not work, not cook? No, but I think if we wish to honor the ordinary, we have to take time to notice it as ordinary, not push it aside to get to the extraordinary. Sunday worship is part of that. I try to make this as ordinary as possible. It is when we make an effort to notice the dignity, meaning, worth, and joy in every ordinary day that we become spiritually alive. It's good to stand at the Grand Canyon and go, ah. It's a lot harder to stand at Division in Fulton and go, ah. But we have to be able to do that if we are to be spiritually alive. We cannot be only alive at the fun moments or the beautiful moments. We have to be present at the ordinary moments and the dull moments because those are the most moments you're going to have. You might as well learn to love them too. The Sabbath is like taking a diary, keeping a diary. It's a moment of pause in the week to look back and notice your life. On this day in 1861, Arkansas seceded from the Union But I'm pretty sure the enslaved people working along the Mississippi did not know. And however many Sabbaths there were, they worked from sunup to sundown every other day of the week. I've already mentioned to you that the word Sabbath comes from a Hebrew word, Shabbat. Well, the word that I'm going to turn to now is Barach. When when I gave you the Kaddish a few minutes ago, Yit Barach, Yit Shabbat, that's to bless. To bless. And as Matthew and I have reminded you over the years, in Hebrew, the word bless means to bow, to honor someone else. And of course, when you think about that, when we hear that God supposedly blessed the seventh day, that's imagining God God is literally giving honor, bowing. Of course, God doesn't bow. But the idea is really interesting because if we can recite a scripture that says, and God bowed and made and, and blessed, why are we upset when our president goes to Japan and bows to the emperor? When that's only about giving due honor to the per- giving due honor to the other person. We all know that in India, thank you, Sloan. I saw you up there. That's okay. There's an amen corner and you're in it. All right. You can join her anytime. I'm not preaching the rowdy sermon today. You know that. Okay. So I don't want you to feel like you're going to miss an opportunity here. I'll preach the rowdy sermon some other time. But we all know that in places like India and among the Buddhists, you greet one another by acknowledging their holiness. You literally bow to them. I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles once years ago in a hotel run by the Japanese. It's in, little, it's in the downtown area. And I walk into the hotel gift shop, and there's a woman 20 years older than I, and she bows to me and says, Oh, hey, was I must And I never felt that she was demeaning herself at all. I felt honored. When we bow to someone else, we give honor to them. We don't demean ourselves. So I want you to learn how to bless. I want you to learn how to bow to things, be it your spouse or your child or your work or your world or even your lawnmower, if you must, to acknowledge that the things around you, ordinary as they are, are filled with meaning because they will not be meaningful unless you give them meaning. We bestow meaning on the things that matter to us. They don't come with little signs, little neon arrows saying, this is meaningful, this is important. No, we give them meaning by bowing to them, by blessing them. I want you to go through, do you realize that if you're a good Jew, there are more than 400 blessings you can make? for particular objects and people. Imagine if you had the opportunity to convey a blessing to everyone you walked past, to every moment, to the great moon that came up last night that no one in West Michigan got to see. And yet I bless it 
that it was there and I knew about it? What if we went through the day effortfully making blessings, bowing to the things ordinarily around us that never get noticed? To honor the ordinary means we are the ones that have to bless it. We are the ones who lift it up, who make it valuable, who give it dignity, worth, and joy. On this day in 1937, the Zeppelin Hindenburg exploded in New Jersey. You may have heard that. And families of 37 people ended a day in mourning that began in hope. So yes, the Sabbath is one way to notice the world in which you live. As, as Maya Angelou said, each person deserves a day away in which no problems are confronted, no solutions searched for. That's what a Sabbath should be, a chance just to notice your being in the world. And blessing is another way to honor the ordinary, to see the seed of everything great in the most ordinary things, such as the acorn that becomes the mighty oak and the tiny mustard seed that becomes a great bush. We bow in reverence for the things that are small and ordinary that give forth greatness. The same thing that Anais Nin meant when she talked about the risk of remaining tight in bud being less than the pain of becoming a blossom. Every ordinary day, every ordinary person is a revelation in bud. And just as we cannot make the flower bloom or the child blossom, what we can is honor the bud, honor the seed, reverence it, encourage it. And yet I have a third way to let you know about. And it goes back to Mr. Shakespeare. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, says old Macbeth, feeling the weight of days and the brief candle of light, and feeling it meaningless and insignificant. I think Shakespeare is famous not because he says things we don't know, but because he says things we do know better than we can say them ourselves. We all know that Macbeth feeling, don't we? of feeling life being without meaning or purpose. And this is, of course, what drives people into the arms of religion or into the charms of decadence. We want something to happen. Anyone who says they've never felt this Macbeth-like chill is lying at least to him or herself. And anyone who says either God or glory is the answer is just as deceived. The problem with being conscious creatures is that we have a price we have to pay. We have to choose whether life matters or not. I don't know whether it ultimately does matter. I know that if we choose to think it does matter, it might. And if we don't choose to think it matter, it absolutely won't. This is a moralistic version of Pascal's wager, by the way. We'll talk about that in private. The best example I can think of is after a long and horrid journey through the futilities of life, Voltaire's Candide and his teacher Pangloss come to a conclusion. Pangloss says, human grandeur is very dangerous. And they conclude to relinquish glory and live simply. When we expect majesty from life, we get misery. When we expect life from life, we get gratitude. The last thing we can do is to be grateful. This is not easy, of course. The siren of fame and fortune is very alluring. We live in times that extol them, and we may feel we have failed at life if we have not become rich or famous to choose to be ordinary, to be grateful for it in its ordinariness, to be unremarkable and glad of it, to be forgettable and proud of it, would seem to mean we have chosen meaninglessness, but this is not true. To choose it is to endow it with meaning. To bless something with our life is to give it power, dignity, to give it worth and joy. And in blessing the ordinary, the way God blessed the seventh day, we truly do endow our lives with worth. Yes, some there be who are perished as though they had never been and are become as though they had never been born, but these were merciful and righteous. Their glory shall not be blotted out, because the assembly declares their wisdom, and the congregation proclaims their praise.
if this is all we do, we are worth everything. So may it be. Truly, so may it be. Though the hour is late, the last hymn is worth singing because it comes from the native peoples of Mexico. It's called Singer of Life. And it says, in essence, that we sing life into being. It comes from the Nahuatl people of Mexico. Not the song, but the poem. And I invite you to sing us into life as we then take ourselves into the social hall to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Like the man says, delays, sidetracks, smoke, dust, cinders, and jolts interspersed only occasionally by beautiful vistas and thrilling bursts of speed. He goes on, the trick is to thank God for letting you have the ride at all. And this too, as another day in that splendid ride we have been given, we didn't start the engine, but we get to go along. How cool is that? So rejoice and be glad in it, and yes, count your blessings. All the capacities of life, be grateful. And also remember that we are here tied by the love which binds us together, giving dignity, meaning, worth, and joy to all our days. Amen. <laughs>